So, uh, my name is Nina Kirchner. I'm one of the two directors of the Bolin Center, and we have this seminar series, a dedicated seminar series that we are running now in the second year. The idea is that the seminar is open to everyone in the Bolin Center, of course, but in this seminar series, it's also uh, that the talk that is given is so broad that even people from the other research areas can understand it. And today we have uh, David Bastwikenhal as a guest of research area four, uh, who will give this seminar. And I'll hand over to Volker Brisha to introduce our guest, and I hope you enjoy the lecture. After the lecture, you will lead the discussion, you will use this microphone, and if you then have a question, you will also have to use this microphone. And just for logistics, and for you as the speaker, we're quite many in this room, but there's also people following the lecture uh, through the streaming. So this is actually more people than just you who's sitting here. But you who are sitting here and have announced that you want a sandwich, there will be sandwiches outside afterwards. Um, if you did not say you want a sandwich in advance, we'll have to negotiate what we do. But this we take a little bit later. Okay, Volker. Okay. Well, so it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to, to introduce to you David Bastwiken. He's actually an old head. He's been here as a postdoc, um, but he finished in 2009 and then has since then actually gone to Linköping. David has a background in limnology. Um, he studied at Uppsala University, limnology. Then he did his PhD at Linköping University, also with Lars Tranvik. Some of you may know him. And then after that, he uh, started postdoc for uh, one and a half years in the United States at the Institute for Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook in New York State. And after that, he returned to Linköping, where he's probably now been spending most of his life, <laughs> and, uh, and had a stint as a postdoc also in our lab in biogeochemistry in the geological science department. And that's also when David and I got to know each other. That's when I started about the same time. So David's now a professor at Linköping University in the so-called TMA Vatten, or Environmental Change. I think it may have changed the name now. And his focus is still methane as, and carbon dioxide in lakes and lakes emi lake emissions, trying to come up with uh, global quantitative estimates of emissions, um, but also functional studies in aquatic lake bodies. And I think this is probably what you're going to talk to us about today. Yes. So I'm looking forward to the talk. OK, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and thanks a lot for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. Uh, I will uh, try to talk a bit about greenhouse gas emissions from aquatic environments and highlighting the challenges we have and um, some illustrate some ways that we are trying to overcome these challenges. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge lots of people that has contributed to what I will say now. There is a long list. There are even more people that has contributed. So thanks to all of those. We also got funding from, from different sources to do what I will talk about. So I want to thank them too. Um, I would like to start with this overall picture that I think that most of you are familiar with. Uh, I use this as a reminder that, that of, of how little we actually know about the global carbon cycling. And because I'm thinking about this green part here, which is actually termed residual landscape, and the world residual indicates that it's the leftovers, right? The stuff you cannot account for somewhere else. So that means that we we have lots of good ideas about where these residual land sink are, but, but we also have some troubles really knowing where it are. And that gives some room for discoveries. And I will illustrate such a discovery now. Uh, and this also illustrates, it, it, of course, I will focus on the aquatic emissions now, but it illustrates that we have those very nice and and, and good-looking carbon budgets. But uh, behind those, there are, of course, big knowledge gaps. This is the carbon budget from the IPCC 2007. And the aquatic inland waters here are just a pipe. It's coming in some carbon from different sources. And equal amount that goes in also comes out to the ocean. There's not much happening. Now, uh, this, of course, is not true, and that was discussed a lot in the aquatic community. Many of you here was involved in this discussion. Um, so what actually happens is that some carbon actually enter the aquatic environments. In the aquatic environments, some can re end up in the sediment, some can go to the ocean, but a lot of it can also go back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or methane. So 
the aquatic environments are active and then the question was okay how active are them are they in this carbon cycling so uh, there was a summary made based on the data that existed at that time that tried to summarize how much carbon gases are emitted from inland waters and for carbon dioxide one number that was widespread was about 2.1 petagram carbon per year and for methane if you recalculate it to carbon dioxide equivalents uh, we are now at 0 0.8 petagrams carbon per year and that is in the same order of magnitude as the this residual land sink or also the ocean uptake if you want to compare with that number so it's fairly large so, so what happened is that in a few years of time a large net flux was discovered that wasn't considered before and this that illustrates i think how there are, there are uncertain parts of this budget that we have to think about um, now this was very crude global numbers based on existing data that were not always optimal for these studies so there's been others regional tests of whether this uh, perspective seems reasonable there was one test from india for example where where India has exceptionally good area estimates of different types of water bodies. So this means that if, if you systematically sample the different types of water bodies that, that they actually have areas for, you can do a very good upscaling exercise in India, much better than we can actually do in Sweden, because they have this, this uh, good area classification of their water bodies. And if you do this uh, based on this study, uh, it's this, the, the outcoming result is similar. The emissions from inland waters is, is high compared to what was considered. In this case, it was 42% of the reported carbon sink of India. So it's significant numbers. And as a result of many efforts by many researchers, the 2013 report now includes outgassing from inland waters. Uh, this was carbon. Methane is a similar story. Uh, in the, this is the, just an impossible to read table, but it's just there to confirm what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that there is no flux from inland, from, of, of methane from inland waters were considered in 2007. Uh, but as a result of the work I just described, it's now in the IPCC budget. So, so there has been a discovery of a large new net flux. Now this flux has changed over time. Um, these are uh, several budgets of carbon dioxide fluxes from inland waters. One of the first was Kohl et al. And then you had Tom Battin, Travik did a survey, and Pete Raymond. And uh, the amount has increased a bit. The, the green part here is what goes to the sea. The reddish brown part is what goes to the sediment. And the blue here is what goes to the atmosphere. The purple is the running water which, which came in and now running waters are considered to be very large. Um, so this change of the amount of flux, it, it also illustrates uncertainty, right? We don't know, we, we are not able to constrain the numbers very well. For methane, the situation is also, uh, a bit challenging because methane is emitted in different ways. Carbon dioxide primarily have a transport through diffusive flux because carbon dioxide dissolves easy in water and then has to cross this diffusive boundary layer to get to the ocean. Methane has, has this too. Methane is dissolved in the water and if it's supersaturated, which is almost always is, it goes to the atmosphere by diffusive flux. But it's produced in anoxic sediments and there you can, if you have anoxic parts of the water column, you can get storage of large amount of methane. And then if the water column is overturning, which it does regularly in many lakes, you get very methane rich water coming up to the surface, and then you get a pulse in this diffusive emission. So that makes it challenging to capture a pulse flux. And it gets even worse because some of the methane forms bubbles in the sediments. It can be released. So you have this bubble flux, which we call ebullition. And that can be very episodic, with very large fluxes happening very short times, and therefore it's difficult to measure. And then there can also be flux through 
aquatic plants that has this gas connective tissue to supply oxygen to the roots and this tissue can also transport gases to the atmosphere so methane can can uh, be emitted that way and what is important is that some of these fast pathways through plants and ebullition and this episodic flux that, that methane can escape being oxidized by methane oxid oxidizing bacteria and those bacteria they sit in the often sit in the in the oxygen where the oxygen meets the methane in the sediments or the water column. There are lots of other processes that that occurs here. I, I don't will not spend time on all of them, but but uh, in inland waters where there is not so much sulfate, the methane oxidation with oxygen is supposed to be most important. Now this was this was inland waters and methane. If you add reservoirs on top of this, you add additional flux pathways. Reservoirs turn out to be an important source of methane as well. And of course, you degas water in turbines. So you have leakage associated to turbines. Uh, and you also have leakage in downstream rivers. And this can be a very large amount if you take in anoxic water, which is rich in methane. So given all these flux pathways, it's difficult to measure the total overall methane emissions from inland waters. Uh, we tried to make a global estimate some years ago now. Uh, this is by latitude for the open water fluxes. And for plant fluxes, we could not do it because it was too limited data. But most fluxes occur in the tropical areas. Reservoirs can be a big part in some areas. Rivers were not so big, but this is, these are big rivers. The small streams were not in this. Uh, and the small streams recently was added by um, work by Emily Stanley. And that had a significant uh, impact on total numbers. Uh, so now, uh, if you convert methane to carbon dioxide equivalent, it would, it would correspond to about 34% of the land sink. Uh, but if that's not, things are changing. This year came another paper by Tonya del Centro et al that actually doubles the inland water methane flux. So uh, there can be a lot of debates about which of these numbers are true or not, but in any case, this variability in numbers shows there's significant uncertainty, and it illustrates the difficulty in quantifying these in robust ways, I think. So it becomes, all this uncertainty becomes, boils down to method, method questions, actually. How can we better measure the fluxes in ways that constrains things and how can we measure in a way that makes upscaling more robust it's so i've been i'm shifting the focus now towards the methods because i think they are a key uh, at present we are using uh, a number of methods and i will try to describe describe them briefly a very common method for aquatic emissions are if you measure the concentration in the water and connected to the concentration that would be in equilibrium with the air, that gives you the concentration difference. And then you have a, a transport coefficient. It's usually called piston velocity or, or um, it's basically a Fickian transport with a transport coefficient here, telling you how quickly things move. And this tells you the direction. And there is a flux. So with this equation, you can estimate the diffusive fluxes dissolved gases, how they flux the atmosphere. You just need to measure concentrations and you need to know how quickly the gas moves across this diffusive boundary layer. Uh, so practically that has been considered easy because concentration measurements are not too hard. Uh, this has often been modeled from turbulence, which in, in turn has been modeled from wind velocity. It turns out that it's not so simple, but that's how it has been done. Uh, another approach that has been used frequently are flux chambers. It's basically putting an enclosure on top of the water or on top of the environment you want to study, and then you measure the gas concentration change in this chamber. It's a robust measurement, but it has a small footprint, and which makes it laborious if you want to cover large scales. Uh, 
at least if you have to do manual measurements of the gas in the chamber all the time. Then eddy covariance is a popular approach in terrestrial systems. It has been uh, becoming more popular on lakes too. Uh, that is, uh, it integrates over a larger area, but your footprint moves continuously with wind speed and wind velocity, right? So it's not always exactly clear what you measure, and it's difficult to distinguish between temporal variability and spatial variability because they come integrated as your footprint moves over time. And it's difficult to resolve specific sources within the footprint. So there are both pros and cons with all these methods. And the data we have had so far is dominated by old monitoring data. And for carbon dioxide, we typically do not monitor carbon dioxide in aquatic systems. Often what has been monitored is alkalinity and pH. And that has been used as a proxy to calculate carbon dioxide. And uh, then we have modeled the gas transfer from wind speed. And it's becoming more and more clear that this has large bias. Uh, in some many waters, there is alkalinity is very low, which makes it difficult to measure. Um, and alkalinity is not always related to carbon dioxide. It can be related to organic acids, for example, and other things. So it may not reflect carbon dioxide very well. Uh, the gas transfer coefficient is also very challenging because the, um, it can be highly variable across water surfaces. For methane, we've often used short chamber, flux chamber measurements. Uh, and that's, uh, evolution is r rarely captured because you have, sh if you cover small areas for short times, you're more unlikely to capture the episodic fluxes that happens um, rarely. And there's also a low number. And this is the reason why we have this data is not because people are unaware of the problems. It's just a matter of, of financing. It's expensive to do this measurement, expensive to, to do it simply. So we've done the best we, we could. Um, and there is also this aspect. We often have worked during daytime. Um, and the samplings were done a few times per year. Martin Wieck here at Stockholm University illustrated this for methane. Uh, he summarized the methane flux measurements from uh, the northern latitudes. And this is number of sampling days. And uh, this is diffusive flux and ebullition. So it shows that most of the fluxes are a few sampling days and diffusive flux. Ebullition, has, ebullition is usually a larger flux component, but has very much fewer measurements. Um, so so this, accordingly, the numbers become uncertain, of course. So we have to think a bit about the variability and um, how well does the data we have represent this variability? Because that actually determines what we know and how we can upscale the numbers. We have tried to do some more intensive measurements of carbon dioxide concentrations in water surface um, using many more measurement points than usually is, is, is possible and also over longer time than usually is possible. And this is what we found from a lake. We can see that it changes a lot over time, both, both in overall levels, but also spatially, where we can have in this is lake circulation, where bottom water comes up in the whole lake, make, increasing the, the, the carbon dioxide concentrations and also the flux of the atmosphere. This is a few days later, uh, and there's very low amounts here, and that's probably because this, the carbon dioxide at the bottom of the lake here has been vented off. The color is the concentration in the surface water, which is used to model the flux through this com in combination with wind speed. So the concentrations are higher here, lower. You see an inlet area up here that contributes stream water that has high concentration. You can see that you have regular events of um, upwelling. Here's wind speed blowing in this direction that pushes the surface water over here and bottom water comes up in this end. So there is things happening continuously in these lakes uh, that we are usually not aware of, but that has a big importance for the upscaling later. If you look at the variability on the methane side, this is what we would find if we did it the traditional way. You go 
in the in the summer you go to a place and typically limnologic sampling is done in the deepest spot because there, there you can take the water column profiles nicely so you go here you'd make your chamber measurements if you happen to go back a few days later you can get twice as high numbers these are three chambers um, if you are interested in uh, to do it in the fall and spring as well it looks like this this is real data from a lake if you are interested in a little bit more shallow water so you you do the water that is uh, deeper than two meters it is a f um, it's a 4.5 meter lake um, it looks like this and if you include the very shallow waters it looks like this and what comes out of this study is that you have a, almost 80 percent of the total flux was ebullition and almost all of this evolution happened in the very shallow water. So these shallow zones that we did not go to traditionally are very important for the methane flux. So our data that we had to make those upscale estimates maybe did not represent this variability very well. So our upscale estimates are kind of uncertain. Um, in running waters, it becomes also challenging because running waters if you go to the small streams you can see visually that they are very heterogeneous you have this um, sh very rapid uh, stream parts with high turbulence you have more calm stream parts um, streams are challenging they are high emitters and what we have done typically is to measure the concentration in the water and combine it with these um, transport coefficient estimates the piston velocity and this is usually wind speed is not useful in small streams so that, that has been generated by tracer experiments instead uh, so we are still wondering about the spatial temporal variability so the situation we have for both lakes and streams is that we have if this is a temporal scales and this is a spatial scale this is a lake situation with a square meter to whole lake and hour day week season year this is our common measurement domain where we do the measurements. And if we do one location, but many repeated measurements, we end up over here. If we do many locations, but once you end up over here, but we want to go in this direction to cover both time and space to get good values for upscaling. So what should we do? One, um, way is to test with our present techniques what is required and this was also done by Martin Wieck in this house he put out lots of flux chambers on his lakes and he tested after doing a massive effort he tested how many chambers would I need to put out and how long time would they need to be there to get within 20 percent of this total number he got so he defined that for small lakes, you would need to have in the order of 11, 12 chambers, and they should be out there 40 days, and they should be distributed over different depth zones and <clears throat> to capture ebullition. For diffusive flux, you can do well with fewer chambers and fewer days. Uh, but still, this is lots of work. So we have to think about how to handle this. It's it's very costly. We we have we live in in situation where, where costs actually limits the kind of data we can get. And this is the reason why the same data sets are used over and over again in many models, because it's so costly to generate new data that sort of better fit our, our, our needs. So then now we'll shift towards what we can do about this. Uh, I've been um, painting out this serious situation. What can we do about it? What if there were inexpensive sensors that could be used to at least reduce cost of sampling? Um, an inexpensive material that could be used all over the world, also in third world countries. It turns out that this is a carbon dioxide sensor that probably is in this house. Many houses have these sensors for regulation of ventilation. More people, more carbon dioxide, increased ventilation. So they are mass produced for ventilation control. Uh, this is a sensor produced in Delsbo up in Sweden. 
by sense air. It has an internal logger. It measures temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide, and it can regulate an external device, a pump, or or something else that can actually do the sampling for you. And it has a time control uh, function in here. And it costs around 800 Swedish crowns. And it has it it. it it's not a super precision instrument, but it does really well actually for for it's plus minus ten ppm, which is good in many cases if you if you select how to do it. So we started to put this in in plastic buckets bought at ÖB <laughs> for low cost. We I went to a toy store and bought those styrofoam rods um, that people use for when they learn to swim. Uh, we put them around the buckets and we bought aluminum tape at Bill Tema. Yeah, intentionally, I mean, you could do this very nicely with high tech things, but we wanted to go low tech because we wanted to make it cheap and possible to deploy in, in also in, in many countries, regardless of, of income. So then, so then you could make a unit here that could measure carbon dioxide flux as a flux chamber uh, with this sensor. Over time, you can regulate how often you want it to measure. It can measure from every 30 second to every, I think, six months or something. You can decide the interval you want it to measure, and you can use nine volt batteries. So you have these units, and you suddenly you can put out many chambers simultaneously, and they measure without you having to go there and take samples. So you can measure variability in space and time uh, simultaneously. You can also, if you let these chambers equilibrate, uh, they, no, they, they no longer become useful for fluxes, but they become useful for measuring concentration in the water because the equilibrated concentration in the chamber will reflect the water concentration. It's a chemical equilibrium. So you can use them for both flux and for, for um, concentrations. This is a basic unit. It can be operated manually in a way. And even if you do it manually, you save lots of time because you don't have to do this sampling and you don't have to do this be at the chamber all the time that you're you can have many of them operating independently you can also take this a step further and and make an automatic chamber system uh, which opens and closes automatically and this is what uh, duke has been doing and some of you know duke he was working here was a P took his phd here and he's continued this work this is a flux chamber unit with a sensor box, and this is a sensor box. It's a basic launch box. It has this carbon dioxide sensor, and it also has this methane sensor inside. This is the methane sensor from uh, Figaro. Uh, it's a semiconductor sensor that is um, good enough for some applications, but it's not a super. We are still waiting for better methane sensors, but it's good for in some cases. So uh, this chamber has this inflatable rubber tube for a one wheeler you know you have in the garden when you when you pump air into this one it will make the chamber open and then if you take the air out of it it will close again that's a cheap way of, of having an opening mechanism you have a pump and some valves and a battery and a solar panel and this is an example from last summer where we put out a number of these chambers on a lake this is giving power um, patterns um, you, you, the power goes up in daytime because the solar panel charges the battery, then it goes down. Um, and then here we have here we have a temperature and humidity, and the blue one here is the carbon dioxide, and the red one is the methane. And every time you see an increase here, there is a flux measurement. And then it goes down because the chamber opens to reset the system, and then it closes, and you get so every slope here is a flux measurement, and you see right away a clear dial variability. It's very strong that we were not actually aware of because we typically measure during daytime. Uh, so this unit is really helpful to understand what's happening over many scales. Uh, this is just I had space in this slide. This is this is an animation I will show you. It's still carbon dioxide concentrations in the water because this is from chambers that equilibrated, uh, and this one will show you. Uh, this is time is per hour. Every shift is per hour, and you will see uh, wind speed and direction here. So this is when you get real time information from 
automatic devices, you can see the dynamics, how things change hour by hour. And you see this upwelling coming here when the wind blows strong enough from, from northeast. And this pattern would be hard to capture if you go there a few times a year and sample in the middle of the lake. So this is kind of simple. It's simple material, simple uh, things, but it can still be very helpful. And it doesn't cost a lot either. I will show an example how this equipment helped us to understand stream fluxes in a specific case. Um, so we tried this uh, sensor network approach to look at dynamics on a, on a stream network. And we used them in several ways. We used, because we had sensors in the chambers themselves, we could use drifting chambers much more easily. We can put the chamber in, let it drift and follow the stream and then pick it up. And the sensor memory had the fluxes during the way automatically. We didn't have to touch the chamber to get the samples. Uh, so that, that could give us the flux. We could also derive uh, this gas transfer coefficient from, from uh, normal trace measurements in some selected stretches of the stream. Um, we could do concentration measurements with uh, chambers that were equilibrating. And we combined this with modeling. I will try to explain how. Um, so low order streams seems to be important. They, have a, they, they are the interface between soil water, which has lots of greenhouse gases in them and the atmosphere. And there's a high turbulence, so things will exchange rapidly. They have a high greenhouse gas input, they have a short gas residence time, and high spatial temporal variability. So extrapolation from few measurements become difficult. If you have a more detailed study where we could put out different measurement stations, and we selected them based on stream slope to account for different types of stream, and we designed stream stretches based on stream slope, so the setup was as follows. We defined stretches of every, we had a two meter digital elevation model, so we could do uh, slope and catchment area. We defined 84 stretches based on a change in elevation. So when you change 0 0.5 meter in elevation, that becomes a stretch. So in flat areas, the stretch becomes very long. In the waterfall, the stretch becomes very short. So it retains from how, the, the definition is how how rapidly does the, elevation, the elevation, altitude change, basically. So the high slope section, section becomes short and the, lo the low slope sections become long. Um, and that was actually key to understand gas fluxes, it seems, because it's a very different gas flux in depending on slope. We use propane injections to determine this gas exchange as a tracer. Um, we used, we had discharge measurement stations so we knew water velocity. And from this information, the slope and the tracers and the velocity, we could make a model of this gas exchange. And then we could use the sensors to have concentration monitoring continuously in the streams. And we can make a flux model. And we could also then later verify this model with the drifting chambers and also mass balance as were possible because we have the sensors. So in this stream network, uh, this is the modeled velocity of the water and the measured velocity. And then we could also model the, this gas exchange versus measured, and it was an offset, but the offset was, was clear enough so we could correct for it. And after doing this, we could see that different slope sections, slope section one is the uh, low slope sections, and slope section five is the highest slope section. So this is high slope, low slope. And this is methane and carbon dioxide. And because of the sensors, we get very high numbers of measurements here uh, compared to the manual sampling with methane, which is tens of samples over some years. And this is thousands of samples. Uh, concentrations in the water is typically higher in the low slope areas and lower in the high slope areas. And this is because the fluxes in the high slope areas are higher, so they deplete the concentrations. It can be counterintuitive if you don't think of the transport, but uh, a high concentration can actually mean a low flux. And these are maps over the stream, the catchment for emissions. 
Now, methane was the few samples only, so it's less robust. Carbon dioxide are much, much more data. The picture is kind of similar, that you have high emissions in the short sections appearing here and there in the catchment. And these are the high slope sections, the waterfalls. In the long stretches, flat ones, it's much lower fluxes. And it's almost an exponential scale here. This is 18 to 75. This is 9,260 to 15,200 millimoles per square meter a day. So it's a big difference. So spatially, the short sections that you would rarely sample manually are a key for the total flux. If you look at temporal variability, this is temporal variability in this gas exchange coefficient. It is driven almost completely by these high slope sections. This is again the high slope section, 6 to 21 degrees slope. The flat ones, the blue here, doesn't show much temporal variability. But when you have high slope sections, you have strong variability in gas exchange depending on discharge. And this is a cumulative change. You can see that the, the total emission of both methane and carbon dioxide here is the emission events is driven by, by, by discharge and discharge and emissions at those short high slope sections. We could verify this by this mass balance approach. This is putting a sensor upstream of a waterfall and downstream of a waterfall. You can see that you, in a low flow situation, you remove about 30% of the gas just with a few meters of waterfall. But if you increase the discharge, you see a higher fraction becomes removed by the waterfall. And this explains, so, the, so the, this, sh this very short, tiny parts of the landscape with high slope streams becomes very important for the total flux from the streams. And the ranges of flux has found over two years were huge, from 3.3 to 90,300 millimeters, millimoles per square meter a day for carbon dioxide and similar high range for, for methane, but lower values. So in essence, these sensors helped us understand the variability that was very large. It helped us understand that 90% of this area has a low slope. The discharge was low in almost 70% of the time. So it's, if you just by time design the measurement program where you go there regularly, you, there's a high chance you would pick a low slope area and a moderate discharge. But if you have continuous, if you did that, you would, you would account for only 36% or less of the total flux. But if you have a sensor network that can, that can account for different parts of the streams with, with limited labor effort, you have a much better chance of incorporating the whole flux. Um, this is Siva who did the work in action. Um, so this was the sensor network example, uh, and I think uh, there's lots of weight. I mean, it's only our imagination that, that limits what we can do with these sensors. They are there, but haven't been used too much in environmental science before. So we, we should just start using them, I think, and, and do what we think is good with them. Another approach that we are working with also is trying to uh, develop a camera that can see the greenhouse gases. And this is a hyperspectral camera that uh, they exist actually for military purposes to, to, as detection systems for, for warfare gases. Usually they are a, a qualitative system. It's, it's on, either it's present or not present, but they can be quantitative as well. This version was um, uh, remade to target methane and nitrous oxide. And water vapor, of course, is present everywhere. So here is the spectra you get, and it has a high spectral resolution. So we can actually identify specific methane peaks and specific nitrous oxide peaks, and the other peaks are water peaks. In many cases, it's difficult to do this with normal infrared cameras, but because of the high spectral resolution, it's possible to distinguish the different gases here. So this camera uh, gives us a gas spectrum in each pixel. If you want a good image of the low concentration gases, you want to have many frames. So if you let it run for 30 to 60 seconds, you get thousands of frames. 
these frames can be combined to look at the spectra and this can give you the a methane map for example in this scene you can also get temperatures and you can model distances in different pixels from from the spectral data in each of these frames you can also follow water vapor because water vapor is a much stronger signal that means that you can follow how the air moves over this time frame so you get the wind speed and wind directions in your scene if you combine this information with this information you can calculate the flux from this camera so this is still in its early phase uh, of development uh, we did some early tests this is a barn with 18 cows inside we were actually going here because we wanted to look at this part here this is the manure it's a friend of mine that, that has a um, small farm and manure you know it's it's supposed to release things we came there but it's a bit north from Lin Shopping. so we had plus degrees in Lin Shopping, but he had he had negative minus degrees and snow on top of this one it was frozen so we were kind of disappointed we came there should we do measurement or not well let's do it anyway and see what we find so we did it and then we saw this instead the methane comes out from the ventilation outlet from the barn so the green is methane uh, that has been of course colored in, in in the computer but but it is direct estimates of methane so we could calculate the the mean flux from each cow in this barn looking at the ventilation outlet with the camera so it was a disappointment here but interesting over here uh, we tried it for other sources as well this is a, a chimney it's a waste it's a waste incineration plant that combusts waste and uh, uh, we looked at the chimney from uh, quite a large distance and we could map the gases across this line here above the chimney and we can also map the gas flow across the line then you can calculate the flux so this is this axis is the line here. You can see the, the flux at each point. So you have this plume of methane and nitrous oxide. We, we knew that, this is an interesting case, we knew that they would emit nitrous oxide because these plants have requirements to reduce um, NOx emissions. And the way to reduce NOx emissions is to add ammonia to the process and then you get nitrous oxide instead. And that's okay because nitrous oxide doesn't have an illegal it's, it's not it's not mandatory to reduce nitrous oxide it's mandatory to reduce nox it becomes a trade-off but this is well known and the company knew this so it's it's not it's it, it's just you can debate whether the regulation is good or not uh, so you, you sort of trade reducing the, the nox versus increasing the nitrous oxide instead we didn't know that they would emit methane at such high levels but that that uh, uh, there there is some work i think to to decide to make optimal combustion processes in many places and some of these emission factors we have for combustion processes may not be very accurate back to the aquatic environment we are not trying the camera on the aquatic environment and this is one of the first images where we can actually detect methane clouds across a lake look, looking across the whole lake uh, so uh, we are uh, very uh, interested in continuing this work and i think it's going to be interesting uh, it's a it's an interesting time now because many new techniques emerge these are just two examples and i think they will help us to generate new data sets that are more appropriate for upscaling and to better constrain large-scale greenhouse gas fluxes so life is exciting thank you very much interesting very complete lots and lots of interesting new technologies that are being used so I open the floor for some questions thank you for a nice talk um, of course there's a reason behind these uh, especially methane fluxes uh, organic matter quality and temperature uh, to name two aspects. Can you comment a bit on that? I think it's absolutely true. I mean, there are many 
we, we know the we know the pro, we know a lot about the regulation of methane production and oxidation and, and how how was organic matter quality organic matter amounts microbial communities needed we, we know what this problem is that we uh, it's often difficult to connect this to actual flux levels in nature so we can we, we can pro predict pretty well i think where the methane will maybe produce to where but how much will reach the atmosphere that's that's a big problem i think so but and hopefully hopefully this if we get better at quantifying at different scales we can also better connect quantitatively these fluxes to our conceptual understanding i hope <laughs> Yeah, likewise, thanks for a, for a great overview talk. Um, my, my question actually relates to, to what you just said about, about scales and upscaling, um, because sensor networks will give us a better understanding and quantification on a catchment scale. But how would you suggest we move on to regional and global scales from that knowledge? So I, I think if we can get better understanding on a catchment scale, this opens up for improved modeling that can be used at greater scaling. Uh, I, the problem I think we see now is that the data set, so we can make fantastic models, but we are limited in the data we have to validate these models. If we can generate better data sets that can better validate our models, we get better models, and then we hopefully our upscaling becomes better. So I don't think we can measure everywhere all the time, but I think we need to, to measure in ways that actually support the models, modeling better than we, than we are able to at the moment. Yeah, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I have actually two questions. Um, the first question uh, is on on this uh, larger lake estimates that you showed the variability of fluxes that you estimated in the lake. Mm -hmm. My question would be on the bias. So, if you do an upscaling uh, with with just the traditional mm -hmm. few measurements mm -hmm. uh, that you had before, and now you then the network uh, an upscaling for the whole lake. Mm -hmm. What was the bias then? Uh, uh, well, first of all, we don't. I think it hasn't been done yet, so, so I will be guessing. <laughs> but for methane, for example, I think the bias would be that the data set we use to validate the models now they are based on measurements that are too scarce in time to represent ebullition, and they may also be representing deep waters more than shallow waters, which also would create a bias to ebullition. And ebullition is the highest. The, the biggest component of the total flux. So I would estimate that from that perspective, many systems may be underestimated fluxes. On the other hand, we measure things in the summertime at daytime when the temperature are highest. So we may be missing measurements in the low temperature parts of the years. So in th that sense, and also nighttime fluxes may be lower. So we may be overestimating in one way, but underestimating in other ways. And we don't know the net result of this at the moment. I would guess that uh, like the temperature dependence is somehow taken into account into the upscaling. So probably it, it, then the, well, like it, the global estimates are more li it, uh, like it, an underestimation. It can be, but the temperature uh, sensitivity you can account for is what is reflected in the data you 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 use to. And if the data you use for validating the model is not there is, there is for example a different temperature sensitivity in diffusive flux than for ebullition. That's clear. And if your data represents the temperature sensitivity in diffusive flux, that may be captured by your models, but the temperature sensitivity and the ebullition may not be captured in the models. So so, so it, it's kind of unclear how the bias is, but I can see bias in many directions that has to be cleared out. The other question was on this um, traditional estimates of um, uh, fluxes uh, by alkalinity and pH um, and this um, concentration difference times K model. Mm -hmm. do, uh, do we have some new uh, Results on how the bias there is a really good uh, publication in biosciences a technical note i i lost the name now uh, um, ah I, I will remember it soon but but it's a really good overview over the bias um i'm trying to remember the name we can talk uh, about I, I, can, I can show it to you, but, <laughs> but it's 2015 technical note in biosciences. It shows clearly how biased the data is in the alkalinity versus, they compare 
uh, real measurements of alkalinity versus PCA2 measurements, and it's a really strong bias uh, in that. Okay, but also using the model with, uh, with this K factor. Sorry, with, with, the, uh, with this K times. Uh, uh, let me think now. So, so that what they argue is that um, so, so some people they have they have. Uh, I think that the the good thing that has been done is that many people that have modeled the fluxes have taken out the a big part of the data that where they think that that alternative measurement doesn't work, and then they work with the rest. But that means that they they base the models on high pH environment they kick out the low pH humic environments so so and that's the way to handle it but uh, it creates a bias that we are kind of we are it's difficult to know how how biased things are in that regard <clears throat> thanks yeah, I guess this uh, oh, oh. um yeah, referring to this K times concentration difference, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the main result from what you showed in the paper was that actually this K is extremely non-constant. Yes. So, so, so that sort of undermines this whole approach. That well, well, some of the, for, for big systems, they've used wind speed, and that may work for really big systems in, in, in open like waters. Large lakes or something. Large lakes or oceans. I think that the first ones were Vannikov doing it for oceans, but there's also, this also done for large lakes. If you look at the lake data in more detail, there are these nice, nice publications on, on, on wind speed relations with K, and there are different equations that all are a bit different. They can differ two th through threefold, fold depending on where in the wind velocity you are. Um, and if you look at the data behind them, it's typically very scattered. So if you go in and look at a specific lake, you find that across the lake, it depends a lot on the lake shape and the wind direction, how actually K is distributed across the lake. And there can easily be a two, threefold variability across each. And, and there are, have been attempts. There is a, a paper by uh, Yves Prairie, um, and uh, I lost that name as well. But anyway, it's a paper about trying to, to look at the fetch dependence on K and try to overcome this problem by a modeling approach. So there are ways of approaching it. But there is also other results showing that wind is not everything. Convection can also be an important component in this. So there, there is on, lots of ongoing work actually to improve the K models, which I think is promising. So it's, it's, it's very non-constant, and but there is work trying to overcome this by connecting it to, 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 to physics, uh, which is good. If you could comment on the hyperspectral camera approach um, what what kind of footprint one one could sort of develop towards to, to use this camera to start to get spatial overviews and to what extent we we, s we will technologically be limited by sort of pixel data processing if we try to do this over time series um, I'll see if I got your question right so we, I, I can start and then you have to you have to <laughs> so so we are trying to make this camera airborne now it's it's not as easy as I thought because it has to be vibration free and it has to be moving at it cannot be put in a normal airplane because the airplane moves too fast it has to be a slower slower aircraft and it has to be vibration free and it becomes a, so so it's so we're working on that now and but the hope is to do airborne mapping with it um, and uh, then when you have so 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 the camera the role of the camera would probably be to it's too expensive to have many of these cameras out there everywhere, but it can be to map landscapes, try to check if we have correctly identified sources or sink areas, where do we have important things, important locations to monitor. And then with these more low cost sensor approaches, the time monitoring can come in at representative places in the landscape that has been, that we have helped to define with the camera. That's, that's one way of thinking of it. On the other hand, I mean, these techniques are expensive now. They may become cheaper in the future. Uh, that usually happens. How do you calibrate them? The camera? Yes. The camera is, so what we've done always, we always compare, we've been running around with, with Los Gatos and measure points in the scenes. But it turns out that it's, it's a very physical measurement. It detects the molecules between the, the lens and the background, essentially. It's, a spectre, it's, it's like an open path, Los Gatos. Essentially, so it's a very physics. It's connected. It's connected to physics and, and, and molecules. So it's 
it's a very robust measurement. It has always con sort of corresponded very well to what we've measured. So, so I, I would ask the question instead, you know, we are now building the, our whole monitor networks on eddy covariance measurements. How do you calibrate those? Would be my quest, return question. To be a bit. <laughs> Hope nobody gets angry with me. <laughs> More questions? If that's not the case, and I thank you very much once again. Maybe a round of applause, and then I should also say that we have actually sandwiches out there. Is it 25? I don't know.